Welcome to the podcast series, Reading with Stephen Bradley Waters, the author of Our Soul's Journey Trilogy and A Father's Daughter series, where I read segments from a collection of books. This episode's book is Misery's Return. He felt nothing at all. He supposed a man who had just cut his hand off in a power saw might feel this same species of nothing as he stood regarding his spouting wrist with dull surprise. Yes, her face shone like a searchlight. Her powerful hands were clasped between her breasts. It'll be a book just for me, Paul. My payment for nursing you back to health. The one and only copy of the newest misery book. I'll have something no one else in the world has, no matter how much they might want it. Think of it. Annie, misery is dead. But already, incredibly, he was thinking I could bring her back. The thought filled him with tired revulsion, but no real surprise. After all, a man who could drink from a floor bucket should be capable of a little directed writing. No, she's not, Annie replied dreamily. Even when I was... when I was so mad at you, I knew she wasn't really dead. I knew you couldn't really kill her, because you're good. Am I? he said, and looked at the typewriter. It grinned at him, we're going to find out just how good you are, old buddy, it whispered. Yes. Annie, I don't know if I can sit in that wheelchair. Last time, last time it hurt you, but you bet it did. And it will hurt next time, too. Maybe even a little more. But there will come a day, and it won't be long, either. Although it may seem longer to you than it really is, when it hurts a little less, and a little less, and a little less. Annie... Will you tell me one thing? Of course, dear. If I write this story for you, novel, a nice big one like all the others, maybe even bigger. He closed his eyes for a moment, then opened them. Okay. If I write this novel for you, will you let me go when it's done? For a moment, unease slipped cloudily across her face, and then she was looking at him carefully, studiously. You speak as though I was keeping you prisoner, Paul. He said nothing only looking at her. I think that by the time you finish, you should be up to the... up to the strain of meeting people again, she said. Is that what you want to hear? That's what I want to hear, yes. Well, honestly, I knew writers were supposed to have big egos, but I didn't understand that meant ingratitude too. He went on looking at her, and after a moment she looked away, impatient and a little flustered. At last he said, I'll need all the misery books if you've got them, because I don't have my concordance. Of course I have them, she said. Then, what's a concordance? It's a loose leaf binder where I have all my misery stuff, he said. Characters and places, mostly, but cross-indexed three or four different ways, timelines, historical stuff. He saw she was barely listening. This was the second time she'd shown not the slightest interest in a trick of the trade that would have held a class of would-be writers spellbound. The reason he thought was simplicity itself, Annie Wicks was the perfect audience, a woman who loved stories without having the slightest interest in the mechanics of making them. She was the embodiment of that Victorian archetype, constant reader. She did not want to hear about his concordance and indices because to her, misery and the character surrounding her were perfectly real. Indices meant nothing to her. If he'd spoken of a village census in Little Dunthorpe, she might have shown some interest. I'll make sure you get your books. They're a little dog-eared, but there's a sign. Book has been well-read and well-loved, isn't it? Yes, he said. No need to lie this time. Yes, it is. I'm going to study up on bookbinding, she said dreamily. I'm going to bind Misery's Return myself, except for my mother's Bible. It'll be the only real book I own. That's good, he said, just to say something. He was feeling a little sick to his stomach. I'll go out now so you can put on your thinking cap, she said. That's, this is exciting. Don't you think so? Yes, Annie, I sure do. I'll be in with some breast of chicken and mashed potatoes and peas for you in half an hour, even a little jello because you've been such a good boy. And I'll make sure you get your pain medication right on time. You can even have an extra pill in the night if you need it. I want to make sure you get your sleep because you have to be back up to working tomorrow. You're meant faster when you're working, I'll bet. She went to the door, paused there for a moment, and then grotesquely blew him a kiss. The door closed behind her. 
He did not want to look at the typewriter and for a while resisted, but at last his eyes rolled helplessly towards it. It sat on the bureau, grinning. Looking at it was a little like looking at an instrument of torture, boot, wrap, strapedo, which is standing inactive, but only for the moment. I think that by the time you finish, you should be up to the strain of meeting people. Oh, Annie, you were lying to both of us. I knew it, and you did too. I saw it in your eyes. The limited vista now opening before him was extremely unpleasant. Six weeks of life, which he would spend suffering with his broken bones and renewing his acquaintance with Misery Chastine near Carmichael, followed by a hasty instrument in the backyard. Or perhaps she would feed his remains to Misery the pig. That would have a certain justice, black and gruesome though it might be. Then do it. Make her mad. She's like a walking bottle of nitroglycerin as it is. Bounce her around a little. Make her explode. Better than lying here suffering. He tried looking up at the interlocked W's, but all too soon he was looking at the typewriter again. He stood, stood atop the bureau, mute and thick, full of words. He did not want to write, grinning with its one missing tooth. I don't think you believe that, old buddy. I think you want to stay alive, even if it does hurt. If it means bringing misery back for an encore, you'll do it. You'll try, anyway. But first you're going to have to deal with me, and I don't think I like your face. Makes us even, Paul croaked. This time he tried looking out the window where fresh snow was falling. Soon enough, however, he was looking at the typewriter again with avid, repulsed fascination, not even aware of just when his gaze had shifted. Chapter 25 Getting into the chair didn't hurt as much as he had feared. And that was good because previous experience had shown him that he would hurt plenty afterward. She set the tray of food down on the bureau, then rolled the wheelchair over to the bed. She helped him to sit up. There was a dull, thudding flare of pain in his pelvic area, but it subsided. And then she leaned over, the side of her neck pressing against his shoulder like the neck of a horse. For an instant, he could feel the thump of her pulse and his face twisted in revulsion. Then her right arm was firmly round his back her left under his buttocks. Try not to move from the knees down while I do this, she said, and then simply slid him into the chair. She did it with the ease of a woman sliding a book into an empty slot in a bookcase. Yes, she was strong. Even in good shape, the outcome of a fight between him and Annie would have been in doubt. As he was now, it would be like Wally Cox taking on Boom Boom Mancini. She put the board in front of him. See how well it fits, she said and went to the bureau to get the food. Annie? Yes? I wonder if you could turn the typewriter around so it faces the wall. She frowned. Why in the world would you want me to do that? Because I don't want a grinning at me all night. Old superstition of mine, he said. I always turn my typewriter to the wall before I start writing. He paused and added. Every night while I am writing, as a matter of fact. It's like step on a crack, break your mother's back, she said. I never step on a crack if I can help it. She turned around so it grinned at nothing but blank wall. Better? Much. You are just as silly, she said, and came over and began to feed him. Chapter 26 He dreamed of Annie Wicks in the court of some fabulous Arabian caliph, conjuring imps and genies from bottles and then flying around the court on a magic carpet. When the carpet banked past him, her hair streamed out behind her. Her eyes were as bright and flinty as the eyes of a sea captain navigating him among icebergs. He saw it was woven, all in green and white. It made a Colorado license plate. Once upon a time, and it was calling, once upon a time it came to pass. This happened in the days when my grandfather's grandfather was a boy. This is the story of how a poor boy... I heard this from a man who, once upon a time... Once upon a time. Chapter 27 When he woke up, Annie was shaking him and bright morning sun was slanting in the window. The snow had ended. Wake up, sleepy head. Annie was almost trilling. I've got yoghurt and a nice boiled egg for you and then it'll be time for you to begin. He looked at her eager face and felt a strange new emotion. Hope. He had dreamed that Annie 
Her solid body clad in diaphonous robes, her big feet staffed into pink sequented slippers with curly toes as she rode on a magic carpet and chanted the incantatory phrases which opened the doors of the best stories. But of course it wasn't Annie that was Sherazade. He was. And if what he wrote was good enough, if she could not bear to kill him until she discovered how it all came out, no matter how much or how loudly her animal's instincts yelled for her to do that, that she must do it. Might he not have a chance? He looked past her and saw she had turned the typewriter around before waking him. It grinned resplendently at him with its missing tooth, telling him it was all right to hope and noble to strive. But in the end, it was doom alone which would count. Thank you for listening. Feel free to check out my book collection from our Soul's Journey trilogy and a Father's Daughter series. All books are available from Amazon in ebook and paperback.